In this video, we're going to talk about uh, altitude generators and uh, this study by Millet and Killian Jornet uh, about Killian Jornet, one of the greatest living mountaineers and endurance athletes, uh, about his use of a, a Norma Barrick hypoxic generator in his uh, world record attempt uh, for the speed record for Mount Everest. Subscribe to the Slow Boat Sailing channel. We give you the secrets to crush your outdoor adventure. We'll also talk about my experiences with the Altitude Tenant Generator over the first few days. Um, so I think uh, one of the, the big hits of Altitude Generators is that there's just a really small amount of literature on this. Uh, if you think about uh, the the uh, scientific studies that have been done on like on uh, altitude generators and runners and cyclists, uh, that's you know the running running as a sport, cycling as a sport are much bigger sports than mountaineering. Uh, so there's just a lot more people participating in running, a lot more interest in running in cycling than there is in mountaineering and so i think that the literature is kind of reflecting that you know the relative the importance of those sports uh in terms of just popularity just pure popularity um and you know so one study that i i cited was this hypoxia conditioning for high altitude pre acclimatization uh, which is a 2022 study but that was published in 2022 you know but they said however uh this research field is still in its infancy and uh and i think that's really the case so i think that the practice of the the norman barrick generators the the altitude generators like this one behind me uh it has kind of gotten way ahead of where the scientific studies are uh and we'll, and i'm going to talk about the rapid ascent of choi oyu uh by adrian Al ballinger and his girlfriend at the time emily harrington but she's now his wife um and and their their plan what they did uh with the the hypoxic generator in the tents uh so that they had their rapid ascent of uh, the 8,000 meter mountain choy OU without supplemental oxygen. All right, so, but I said I'd talk about uh, Killian Jornet. So Killian Jornet, uh, he's been the world champion in ski mountaineering, ski running. Uh, he's won the Western State Ultra Trail, the Trail du Mont Blanc, uh, the Hard Rock 100. Among others, uh, he also has the speed records for Mont Blanc, Denali, and Aconcagua, or at least he had them at one point. I, I, I haven't tracked it since the, the article, so, but I think he's pretty good. I think his co-author said that he had the highest recorded VO2 max of any human being. Uh, so, uh, he, he's, he's a very fit guy, so obviously, you know, what he can achieve and you know what most uh, people that are thinking about doing a, a mountaineering expedition probably a guided expedition i would think most people that are going to do it are going to do it through a guided expedition of a high altitude peak above 5,000 meters such as um elbrus is pretty much closed down but uh kilimanjaro or uh, uh ohos the highest volcano or uh, Aconcagua, the highest point in South America, those types of expeditions, or Lenin Peak, something like that, or the 8,000ers. So uh, I think most of those, most of the people who'd be watching this and thinking about doing this would be on the client side, not on the, the, the professional mountaineer side. But obviously Adrian Ballinger and his his um, wife, Emily Harrington, are professional mountaineers. 
and uh, I would say Killian Jornet is also a professional mountaineer. Uh, so, uh, with the what Killian Jornet did uh, was that he did 260 hours in a tent over 46 days. So, uh, six to seven weeks, six and a half weeks, something like that. Uh, and he also did 90 hours on the treadmill with the mask on. So you can see the picture of the mask. Uh, me and the mask below. Um, I advocated, you know, just doing your computer work with that mask so you just get more hours in. Uh, I think that's actually, from my experience, just from the five days of trying it, that's very helpful to kind of calibrate whether your tent is too leaky or not. So if you got it, uh, you know, you can look at your pulse ox here and you, if you're using the mask once in a while, like while you're just like sitting at the computer uh, watching a video or whatever, uh, then, or doing work, uh, then you'll get a good idea of what your pulse ox should be in the tent. And if your pulse ox is going like way up compared to uh, what, what you're getting in the mask uh which you know is less leaky potentially than the tent uh then it's a good idea that 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 the tent's not too leaky uh whereas um you know i would say you know my take on it is that like if i'm i'm at ten thousand feet uh in the mask then i would probably turn up the tent by 500 feet uh just to just because I think it's going to be a little bit leakier to kind of get the same exposures. But the ideal thing would be to have an uh, oxygen sensor. Anyways, so what Killian Jornet would do eight hours in the tent, and then he would do, uh, it looks like, probably like three hours on the treadmill. So he did like 90 hours uh, above 4,000 meters on the treadmill based on the hype the hypoxia mask, uh, the Norma Barrick hypoxia mask, and we can find it. Like, so I assume he put this on, and he was on the treadmill running. Um, and then uh, he also did, uh, and I don't believe he was sponsored by Hypoxico, but they do mention that he, d he used uh, Hypoxico's generator and tents. Uh, same thing for Adrian Ballinger, who has a deal with Hypoxico. I'm sure he gets some sort of, uh, I don't, you know, he doesn't list them as a sponsor, but I'm sure that he probably gets some sort of uh, referral fee, but I'm just guessing, uh, for recommending that to his clients, because he does the rapid ascents. Uh, if you go to his website for Glow, they've got about eight different rapid ascent expeditions all over the world. For different mountains, I think two eight thousanders and several other uh, high altitude peaks, um, where they do that they and they recommend between four to eight weeks, I think. So for the smaller expeditions, maybe four weeks, and for the longer ones, eight weeks. It seems like he and his girlfriend did six weeks for their rapid ascent of Choyo Oyu without supplemental oxygen, I believe, uh, and they did twelve thousand to sixteen thousand or. 12,000 to 18,000 of simulated altitude in the tent um, at home uh, prior to their rapid ascent of Choyu Oyu, the 8,000er. Um, whereas uh, Killian Jornet here, uh, this, this is based on the study uh, on top to the top a climatization strategy for the fastest known time to Mount Everest by Gregory Millet and Killian Jornet. Uh, and then, so Jornet also, so he did 260 hours in the tent, 90 hours on the treadmill above 4,000 meters, and then 30 hours on the treadmill above 6,000 meters, and then he spent like uh, I think it was less than a couple weeks in the Alps, right? And what's the highest elevation in the Alps? That's 4,800, right? Mont Blanc, right? Uh, meters. Uh, so, 
he had a mixture of Norma Barrick and then he had some pre-acclimatization and then within five days uh, he's, I think he summited Everest the first time that was not his record attempt but that was his first he did two ascents he also I think he did not use fixed lines or anything like that uh, although on his first attempt he said he walked on a few ladders uh, but Uh, so anyways, it was a mixture of kind of the passive, uh, low oxygen, uh, you know, the enriched nitrogen air, uh, and a mixture of where he's just sleeping, and the mixture of the treadmill. Um, and it seems to me, so I've also been going back through the studies, so the... It seems to me that the literature has done very few studies of like long duration. I, I can't think of one that did like a 300 hour or a 200 hour uh, where people were in the tent and then they uh, went to altitude and saw what the AMS symptoms are. It's more like seven days or what I've been seeing uh, so there's a number of these uh, studies. There's this uh, Fulco et al., which people tend to, 2013, uh, the effectiveness of pre-acclimatization for high altitude exposure. And so people will say, well, the Norma Barrick is just not effective uh, for this uh, because we had these people in the tent for seven days and they were not significantly more likely to or less likely to have AMS. Now they were less likely, they just were not significantly. So the sample sizes on these studies are quite small, so there'll be like 40 people maybe, and they'll have a control group of 20 and a, and a treatment group of 20. Uh, so if you're comparing like the, the people that didn't have any, that they, they're the sham group, the placebo group, versus the the people that actually had uh, hypoxia tents uh, they were uh, the people that had the hypoxia tents were actually less likely but not significantly so uh, and there's kind of a number of studies that are like that uh, where uh, that they're just not significantly so I think uh, training in Norma Barrick hypoxia and its effects on acute mountain sickness after rapid descent to four five five nine meters. This is uh, Kai Shom Shomer et al. Um, that that also they they found a significant difference in AMS at three thousand six hundred meters three yeah three thousand six one one meters. But not at four thousand five five nine, which is like a hut in in um, the uh, Alps. I think it's a very maybe the highest altitude hut in the Alps, and uh, that. Uh, but they did find that the the people that did have Norma Barrick exposures, that is generator exposures like this, did have a lower incidence of AMS. Uh, you know, I think what's not in doubt is that the exposure, and this is basically from the, the literature focusing on runners, is that they, and cyclists, is that the exposure to uh, the generator is going to increase your red blood cell mass, which I've heard could be as uh, increase your. Uh, oxygen carrying capacity by two to seven percent depending on how long you do it and how you react to it um, and then controlling you know if you're you don't your training doesn't suffer because of that uh, so that that kind of epo production and the the red blood cell mass is not in doubt it's just kind of that the fact that you're you're at the same pressure is not as hard on the body as if you were going to real altitude and you had lower pressure and lower lower uh, oxygen in the blood. So in this case, we're just lowering the oxygen in the blood, but we're not decreasing the pressure 
uh, in the atmosphere, and I, you know, I, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a dispute that it would be better if you could uh, do that altitude. I think the question is, um, is this effective for somebody that cannot spend the time in uh, real altitude? And I, I suspect it is. What I would like to see from the studies, and I think that it's a doable thing, is that they need to partner with some of these providers, especially of like 8,000 meter peaks. Alpine Glow is not the only one encouraging its clients to do this, although maybe it was one of the first, to, to get them to have some of their clients sign waivers, if you could partner with them, and then look at that. Uh, you wouldn't have a placebo group, but look at that versus, uh, you know, people that have less rapid ascent expeditions. My, uh, based on the Jornet thing, there's, uh, and I think there's, there's some other uh, case study articles that have kind of talked about this in the academic literature. Uh, my take is that, you know, they probably would not be able to run these expeditions that are shorter um, if the AMS rate was way higher because they had cut time off the expedition uh, that if this would eventually catch up with them that they they just wouldn't have clients they'd have angry clients um, the clients would be looking at the other people on Everest who are not getting sick and they'd be upset and they want their money back, and they wouldn't want to. They wouldn't want to work with Alpine Glow anymore, or other providers that are doing these these um, fast ascent expeditions based on the altitude chambers. Um, so I mean, I think that I I think it's just that there hasn't been rigorous studies of this, and you know, I mean, typically what would happen in kind of the business literature that you know some academics would get access to company data and maybe they would uh you know uh they would blind it and stuff like that uh but i'm kind of surprised that that hasn't happened yet in the you know the sports literature or the medical literature associated with altitude that they've actually looked at what's kind of going on in practice in 8,000 meter mountains for sure, but also even these lesser peaks like Aconcagua. Uh, so for instance, I did an expedition with Peak Planet. They didn't, I got no discounts. I paid full price. Uh, they also kind of have a deal with Hypoxico and recommend to some of their clients to do that. They don't require it, but they say, oh yeah, you could use this generator to, to help you out. You know, the reason why I didn't do that uh, was, I'd, it was just really hot during the summer. So I did something kind of similar to what Jornet did, was that I did have some time off before the, the Kilimanjaro expedition, and and I went to Colorado, right? And so we climbed Wheeler Peak in New Mexico and lived at 7,000 feet, and then we uh, went to Colorado and went to Fair Play and uh, oh, what's the other town where they have all the races uh, at 10,000 feet and uh, then climbed El uh, Elbert, Mount Elbert, the highest point in the, the Rockies uh, and in, in Colorado. Uh, and, and we also drove up to, uh, I think, Mount Evans. And then we also uh, took the train up to Pikes Peak, where most of these studies that are in the U.S., they're taking people up to Pikes Peak, so 4,300. I think that's the other thing that I kind of, just kind of the big unknown in these studies. Uh, we've got the kind of anecdotal evidence that of Jornet, right? Uh, I think he only slept at 4,000 feet, uh, 4,000 meters. He, I don't think he went higher than 4,000 meters sleeping. Whereas, uh, you know, Ballinger and his um, Emily Harrington, um, you know, went to 5,000 meters uh, in terms of their sleeping in the, the altitude tents. So, uh, you know, I don't think there's a lot of 
stuff that kind of goes beyond this 4,600 meters uh, where they have the hut in, in the Alps or, or uh, where they have the, the, the train or the road to Pikes Peak in, in Colorado. And it would just be interesting if they looked at some of the people that are doing these rapid ascent expeditions and got their permission uh, to, you know, to study them and got the permission of people that are not doing the rapid uh, um, ascent app, uh, expeditions and study them too and, and see how that works. Um, you know, I would give you more details about what their plan is in terms of like the so it's a six week plan or an eight week plan for an 8,000 meter mountain you know how do you go up altitude etc I mean I personally think you'd want to be flexible but I think that that it's probably very likely that they're not going up a thousand feet which is a very conservative estimate of how much you could go up per night versus 1500 feet in the literature although it's probably closer to 1300 feet per night because it because that the literature says on day three or four you need to rest or you stay at the same altitude so that works out to be closer to three to four hundred meters of, of sleeping elevation per night uh i think that you know there you should have some flexibility in it but i suspect that 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 uh, if you've got an eight-week plan, then you're going to uh, you're you're probably not going to go up by a thousand feet per night. I showed you that if you go up a thousand feet per night, you'll get to the the max of the generator very quickly. Given you go to mid altitude day one, and then uh, two thousand five hundred meters or eight thousand feet on day two. Uh, so. I guess my experience kind of going up like 500 feet. I've actually kind of slowed it down than my plan. Uh, is that uh, I don't sleep as well as I do if I'm uh, at, uh, you know, just sleeping in my normal bed. Uh, but it's not that much worse. Uh, it, and it's better than how I slept in a tent at sea level. <laughs> <laughs> just a week ago so i mean so i think that's the other thing is like well uh a you don't have the time to get off right so you don't have the time for the pre-acclimatization hikes in colorado uh or in the alps before you go to the nepal uh but also uh you don't have uh when you are actually doing the 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 actual true altitude acclimatization in this different location um, or before you get to the big summit, uh, you're going to be probably, you know, above the highest human settlement a lot of times and in a tent and, you know, how is your, how are you going to be sleeping in the tent? <laughs> I slept pretty well in the tent. In, in Kilimanjaro, uh, except for the last night. But I, I, I think that, you know, you're probably, if you're in a, on a bed, uh, even if with reduced oxygen, you might be sleeping better than if you're pre acclimatizing in a high altitude location where you're not actually uh, in a house, but you're in a tent. All right. So that's what I uh, had to say. I I think they are effective. I think the studies are a little bit too limited. They don't have a long enough time for the statistical studies. I think there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that these long normobaric generator uh, and fast ascent expeditions work. Um, whether we're talking about Killian Jornet or if we're talking about Alpen Glow and its clients or Alpen Glow's founder, um, Adrian Bollinger, that it is effective 
we just don't have statistical evidence of it yet and that's probably because the mountaineering market is such a small market and it's as kind of such a niche sport it would be my take compared to cycling and running which you don't think of as the big sports but they i think there's a lot more people that participate in running and follow running and a lot more people that participate in cycling and follow cycling uh, than participating mountaineering or follow mountaineering uh, and I think that's part of the issue and so if we had kind of bigger studies and longer duration studies of the Norma Barrick chambers I think we would like to see statistical analysis of and also looking at different elevations than the elevations that they're looking at right that they mostly looked at for running and cycling which is they're mostly focused on elevations of 2500 to 3000 simulated elevations in the tent uh, for cycling and running uh, versus what's more relevant for high altitude mountaineering would be higher elevations in the tent like Adrian Bollinger and his wife uh, experimented with uh, on their rapid ascent of Choyoyu, so closer to 5,000 meters. Okay, subscribe.